Well, um, we are really happy to introduce uh, Professor Emeritus Michael Byron from uh, Durham University, <laughs> whom many of you will know as a very dynamic and influential researcher within the field of intercultural communication and intercultural education with worldwide reputation. He has taken the initiative uh, to innumerable international research and development projects on cultural studies in language education, bilingual education, student resident abroad, and intercultural citizenship. He has been very active in the Council of Europe in developing the field of intercultural and citizenship education. He took the initiative of creating CultNet in 1996, and it's this global and expanding network of researchers that is behind this summer school. I'm very proud to have collaborated with him on several occasions, among others, the project and the book that we wrote together, Language Teachers, Politics and Cultures. So the floor is yours, Mike. Thank you very much. It's nice to have a friend who introduces you, isn't it? Uh, there is a handout, and my faithful uh, helpers, I think, have distributed that, have they? So it's simply what you will see on the screen, um, except for the first thing. I was interested yesterday in, and I can't remember who, oh. um, and I can't remember exactly what one of you said, but one of you yesterday said uh, something like that. What can we do as researchers to get involved in, and I think that was sort of in society and in, in uh, issues, in social issues. Um, one way to answer that would be to focus on policy uh, and do research on policy. Um, indeed, many researchers get involved in evidence-based policy making and so on. I don't think we're quite at that level uh, ourselves here in this context, but uh, it was my first thought yesterday afternoon as somebody said that. And I thought I might also mention as a kind of preliminary to what I'm going to be saying, um, that in the UK, in many cases when you're making uh, proposals for grants, not as a PhD student, but as a, as, as a member of a uh, university, as it were, um, then you have to provide uh, a number of referees or names of referees who might be consulted, and that nearly always now includes the, the notion of a user. You have to provide the name of a user. Of your, of your research or the research you're proposing to do. So in that sense, um, it's becoming increasingly required to get involved in some way. Um, but really what I want to do this morning is, as a consequence partly of reading some of your essays, uh, but also I'd anticipated this anyway, um, maybe helping to clarify through what I want to say this morning the ways in which you uh, and others are formulating their research question, or possibly questions. But I often say, you know, you only want one, you only need one, rather. You only need one good research question, uh, not a whole list of research questions. Uh, another kind of preliminary mark I would say is that um, what I'm going to be talking about is perhaps at the applied end of research work, um, and not, uh, not all research that is being done by people here is perhaps a, as much at that end as what I'm going to be talking about. But the kind of research which, as it were, typically in the, in the, final, uh, par in the final paragraph almost, but certainly the final chapter, will say things like, implications of my findings for school, for university, for whatever, are this, that and the other. So, uh, I suppose what I'm trying to do is look at different research methods and purposes, not all research methods, of course, um, but, uh, but some, um, and try to emphasize that it's not just a matter of finding the best method. Uh, it's not just a matter of technical choice. Um, so what I'm going to be doing, because of the title of the conference, or the summer school, uh, rather, 
is using some material on identity to illustrate, but that's not my main focus. Uh, the material is from some projects some time ago now, uh, and it's not fully contextualized in what you'll be seeing on the screen. Um, but uh, it will do for my purposes, I hope. Um, there was, in 1995, in the European Commission, um, the Council, not the Council of Europe, but the European Union, produced a little booklet, which, and I can't even remember the exact title of it, but it was The Learning Society, or words to that effect. Uh, that, in a sense, is still the policy of the European Union. It's never been revoked. It's, it's still, as far as I know, I haven't looked very recently, available uh, online. Um, this is from chapter four, which was about language learning. This is the second of, a four or th of three or four statements about language learning. The first one, which you haven't got there, uh, talks about the need for language learning as a basis for personal and employment opportunities. Um, it doesn't need, we don't need an awful lot of research to say, to know that uh, language learning will lead to employment opportunities. But this second statement, uh, which you've got on the screen there, languages are also the key to knowing other people. Proficiency in languages helps to build up the feeling of being European. I've put the emphasis in, that was not in the original, with all its cultural wealth and diversity and of understanding between the citizens of Europe. Um, now that is a different kind of assertion to the ones which say, learn languages and it will be useful for getting a job, which was the first statement. It's a different kind of assertion. Um, it is an assertion. It is, in, it is, in fact, as far as I can see, an unsupported assertion. And it's the sort of thing that, in, uh, in theses and so on, gets criticised immediately, underlined, unsupported assertion. Uh, you mustn't do this kind of thing. However, this is not a thesis, it's a policy statement. So... Um, it's a policy statement and therefore, without going too far into definitions of policy, it's stating what is desirable rather than what is the case. What perhaps ought to be the case rather than what is the case. Um, and it's in a sense allocating value to what they think ought to be the case. It's clear that uh, the feeling of being European is something which is to which, it, to which a positive value is allocated. So it's a policy statement. At the same time, as I said, it's an unasserted, uh, unsupported assertion. And in a sense, another way of thinking about it is that it's a hypothesis. A hypothesis that foreign lang proficiency in, foreign, in languages, by which they mean foreign languages, basically, uh, helps to build up the feeling of being European. So it, in that sense, as the title, as the top of the page says, it's a hypothesis about a causal relationship between language uh, learning and identity. In this case, um, some kind of European identity. Um, so the first thing one does with this hypothesis is say, well, is there, is there any, any, any support for this assertion? Or this hypothesis. Claire yesterday mentioned David Block's work and in his uh, book from a few, uh, several years ago now I think, um, he does look at the question of whether there is or was support for that assertion that learning languages, and we're talking here implicitly, I think, about languages in the classroom in Europe, as it were, in the European classroom. He looks into whether there is any support for that assertion in, the, in empirical research. And he concludes that there's little or no likelihood that language learning in the foreign language classroom will affect learners' identities. Um, but, of course, we can continue to look there is no final statement, as it were, from, from empirical research. You can keep looking. So it's still possible to treat that hypothesis 
uh, and look at it in different ways. So how might one test that hypothesis that language learning builds up a feeling of being European, creates a sense of being European? Well, we could carry out an experiment, couldn't we? We could, we could have um, uh, one group which is taught languages and another group which isn't, uh, and find out whether at the end of being taught languages, however that might be operationalized, uh, they feel more European. I don't know of any examples of that. Very few experimental designs are to be found in foreign language teaching and learning. Uh, a few, there not, not many, but there are some. But I don't know any. There may be, but I don't know of any, which, which test the hypothesis in that kind of classic uh, experimental way. Um, an alternative would be to carry out some kind of survey on language learning and, uh, and, and uh, it says text, it should say test, of course. That's Bill Gates' fault, he never corrects my, my typos. Um, so work out uh, some kind of data on language learning among uh, a group of people who are surveyed and some kind of test of feeling European and then of course test for correlations but, of co but again classically we must be aware of the fact that correlations are not causes. So even if we did find that uh, learning languages correlates with uh, a feeling of being European, um, well it would be an indication but it's certainly not a cause. And we cannot, therefore, on that basis, uh, support that assertion. Um, another possibility might be to survey self-reports, reports by learners involved, and to what extent they feel they say that they are, have a stronger sense of feeling European uh, as a consequence of language learning. And then I found an example from the year abroad. Again, uh, Claire mentioned yesterday that David Block suggests that the year, abro the year abroad, which means the study abroad under some kind of uh, system, whether it's uh, the Erasmus programs or, or whatever it might be, um, is unlikely and perhaps uh, to have any long-term effect. Well, we'll come back to that. Um, but in, in empirical terms of, of, of uh, carrying out a survey, and students talking about um, their feeling of being European as a consequence of uh, study abroad. I found this, in, uh, this study on international student migration and the European year abroad effects on European identity and subsequent migration behavior. Well, let's not worry about the subsequent migration behavior just now uh, and look at what, what they found when, um, when carrying out their survey and asking people to agree or disagree uh, with five statements about the year abroad. And for example, the kind of thing that they had was, living in another European country has increased my sense of belonging to a European cultural space. And 60% uh, said, agreed with that, a quarter of them disagreed, and 14% or so uh, didn't, uh, uh, sorry, quarter were not, not, not sure, and 14% disagreed. So that kind of thing exists. Uh, and I suppose the phrase belonging to a European cultural space is something similar to the assertion of the policy statement that uh, it, that learning languages builds up a sense, sorry, builds up the feeling of being European. Uh, belonging to a European cultural space, feeling of being European, maybe that helps us to see, uh, to get some support for that policy statement. Um, but it's not quite the same thing as saying learning languages builds up a sense of belonging to a European cultural space. So. Maybe we could, in another survey, carry out a similar kind of analysis and instead of 
living in another European country perhaps have learning another European language and see whether there's a similar kind of results. So let's suppose uh, that we had a, in our survey learning another European language in my country has increased my sense of belonging to a European cultural space. And let's suppose that you had roughly the same kind of results. Um, and if therefore 60% agreed with that, um, that learning another European language in my year abroad has increased my sense of belonging to, to a European, again, sorry about the typo, a European cultural space. Uh, or let's assume that 90% said that. Does that confirm the hypothesis? But, and, well, maybe it does. We'll not worry too much about uh, uh, the... the well, 90 percent is, is pretty good, isn't it? And um, it's unlikely that you get that, of course. I'm just inventing that. But let's suppose it were 90 percent. Again, does that confirm the hypothesis? Does that support the policy statement? More importantly, does it allow us to predict in a way that the policy statement that I showed you hopes will happen. It doesn't use, it doesn't predict, but it, it implies that it hopes that language learning will build up this feeling of being European. Does that 90%, that kind of survey, if, we, if it existed, would it allow us to say that all learn, learners of European language will, will, as a consequence, feel European because they learn languages? If it did, then that would be very important. It would be very important to support language learning in Europe, Let, not only with respect to uh, the usefulness of language learning, but also with respect to this notion of European identity, which is something which for some time now, years and years, has been encouraged and from time to time comes to the surface in policy statements uh, as important. After all, the European Union, the 20, is it 25 or 26 or 25 or so countries of the European Union, are the first group, the first grouping of nation states which have grouped themselves politically and in that sense created the potential for a European identity which is parallel to or analogous to the way what has in practice happened um, in nation states uh, through their education systems. Again, let's not go too much into that just now. It's just one of my interesting, one of my interests. But clearly, education systems have, among other things, the purpose of creating national identity, uh, and that's been well documented. The European Union and the, uh, might well therefore hope that. European education systems will create a sense of European identity in a, in a similar fashion. So, that might be worth doing if you really want to do research which, as it were, makes a difference, to use that awful phrase. Um, but of course, it doesn't tell us uh, why there might be such a causal relationship uh, or indeed whether just how much of a causal relationship it is and whether it's a, a, a one-way causal relationship between language learning and European identity, or whether those who sense, have a sense of belonging to Europe become better language, language learners, it might be a mutual relationship. And it doesn't tell us what uh, the phrase belonging to a European cultural space really means. So the second option, having gone through some of the um, kind of experimental cause and effect attempts to look at this policy statement would be to find out what, uh, under, what trying to understand what European belonging or belonging to European cultural space means. But means to whom? Um, are we interested in what it means to those people who wrote that policy statement? Are we interested in what it means to the students who were surveyed in uh, the kind of survey I've just mentioned? Um, or, or, or what other social groups might have a stake 
in understanding what belonging to Europe means. Now, does it mean, for example, the same thing to national politicians as to European politicians? Um, and, and so on and so on. Um, but again, knowing exactly what those students who ticked or said, yes, I agree that my year abroad has made me feel that I belong to a European cultural space, uh, those who, who, who ticked that and agreed with that statement, we don't really know what they understood by that phrase, belonging to European cultural space. So, I've got an example which might, it's an example, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's uh, no more than an example to try to focus, to, to keep within the, the topic, the theme of the conference. Um, this is, and again, perhaps I should just remind you what, that, that Claire yesterday was uh, talking about, is, as it were, long-term effects, and also mentioned, if I remember rightly, that David Block says it's unlikely that um, study abroad or a year abroad or residence abroad for, for students learning foreign languages will have an impact upon their identity. Um, well, it's an empirical question. Um, and this is a bit of a, an answer empirically from one student. This is Lynn, which of course wasn't her, her, her original name. And I can't even remember what her original name is, even if I wanted to. Um, here is someone who was talking about her, and she had been, she had been uh, and she was still, a student, an English student of French at a, French, at a university in, in Britain. And she's talking about having just returned from her year abroad in, um, in France. Um, so, so she says, I would now say, now she's being interviewed as soon as we could after she returned, but that was about four weeks after she returned, in fact. Uh, so she would now, she said, I would now say, I'm not sure now, but when I came back uh, a few weeks earlier from France, I, I would say I was European rather than English. I would love to be French, but, but you can't. I can never be French because you would have to be born French. I could be a European. And this is the bit which interests me for our purposes. I couldn't be French, though. There's no way you can become French. You could live in France, you could speak French, but you'll never be, fr be French unless you're actually born French. So, Lynn has a view. Parquet David Bloch, as it were. Um, she certainly would like to be French at this point in her life. She, but more interestingly, she has a... She has a theory. She has a view of what ethnicity is, basically. Um, she has a, a theory about ethnicity which says that you have to be born into a social group, uh, and in particular an ethnic group, in order to be a member of that group. Whether she's right or wrong in terms of um, more systematic scientific theories isn't all that interesting, um, but indeed it does correspond with some uh, discussions in, in the sci more scientific literature about ethnicity. Um, but, so she's, she's got this view, she's got this theory that uh, it's not possible to become French unless you're born French. All the other things you can do, you can live there in France, you can speak French, uh, but you can't be French. But on the other hand, she's got a different perspective on being European. She's making an interesting comparison, as it were, or contrast more rather, between, she's saying you can't be French, but you can be European. So the implication is you, you don't have to be born European to be European. Um, she doesn't say you have to speak European. Um, so maybe we've got somebody here who uh, supports the assertion of the policy statement at the beginning. Um, and it's the beginnings of some data which might help to support that policy statement. It's, and I think, well, not from this, but from the rest of the discussion, um, I think she saw being European as a positive uh, um, phenomenon, it's something to which she allocated value to use the jargon or to use the definition of, of policy. 
So she saw being European as a positive alternative, as it were, to giving... Again, I, the implication from what she was saying is, um, I would love to be French, and as we'll see later, that implied that she would have to give up being English. However, you can't be French, so you didn't have to face the, program, the, the prospect of giving up being English. The, 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 the research wasn't strictly about this topic, so it wasn't pursued in any, any great detail. And, I just, and as I said at the beginning, it's only an example which, uh, which because that's the topic of our, of our, of our, of our conference. Um, but the question of long-term effects was raised again by Claire yesterday, and um, with respect to her own, watch, her own work on subjectivity, and also what she said about, or reported about what David Block says. Uh, we talked to Lynn again ten years later. We found our student, the students, uh, most of them, not all of them, uh, ten years later, and talked to them again about what that year abroad and their language learning had meant for them. And it's not, again, I'm not going to go into the details of that, that's not the point here. But Lynn, ten years later, is married to a Belgian man. She has a small daughter, I think uh, less than a year old at the time, um, and living in Belgium, living in Brussels, in fact. So what does she say ten years later? Um, she's talking about, on that side, she refer, she's talking about Belgian identity, if you like. I haven't really got roots on that side, but I'm putting down roots on that side in, in Belgium, or in Belgian-ness. Um, I'm putting down roots in that way by learning through them, and them refers to her parents-in-law, her, her husband's uh, parents, oh, as it says. Uh, and I would like my daughter, as well, to learn from, her, from grandparents. So, and then she goes on a bit further. I will always not be Belgian. Interesting um, native speaker statement, isn't it? I will always not be Belgian. Probably would get corrected by foreign language teachers, but anyway, she's a native speaker. And that's what she said, I will always not be Belgian. I will always be English. But then there are so many other people who are in the same situation in Brussels. It's not a gaping difference. So she's beginning to rethink about her sense of Englishness, Belgianness. Uh, of course, some people would say that Belgianness doesn't exist, but let's not go into that just now. Um, and she's beginning, beginning to add to her notions of identity um, the, the, the ways in which she can learn from other people, from, not from her parents, but from her husband's parents. And so she's got a theory again of how ethnicity is, is, is acquired. Um, but she still feels that she can't be Belgian, she uh, will always be English. In the same way as ten years later, she uh, talked about you can, that she could not be French. So, but she's gradually, therefore, introducing a little complexity into her theory. Of course, I mean, she didn't know what she said ten years earlier, and it would be unfair, or, and I'm not making any, I'm making comparisons, but only to bring out things. It's not a question of, of saying, um, of, of, in a sense, commenting upon, certainly not criticising in any sense, what she's saying. Um, I will always be English, she said. Not that I have any great sort of sense of national pride or anything like that, I like coming back, and we joined the National Trust this Easter. Now, the National Trust is, um, an, is a, a body which looks after uh, the great stately homes of England, which have been handed over to the nation and so on. Uh, and in that sense, and indeed, uh, as, as has been pointed out elsewhere, the National Trust is an, is a, an organisation which maintains icons of national identity, as its title suggests. So. The fact that they've joined the National Trust again tells us something about what she sees as important in, in, in nationality or in ethnicity. What's more important, or what's interesting, more interesting is I think that's important for my daughter. I really want to do as much as possible to make her know, to have her, her learn her British side. And like many of us, Lynn doesn't make a great fuss about the difference between British and English. 
Um, if she were Scottish, she might be a little bit more careful. Um, her British side of her nationality, so that she has roots there as well, and that's the word roots coming up, uh, as she had a, a moment ago. And then she goes on, it's obviously going to be different for my daughter. She's never going to be English, and she's never really going to be wholly Belgian. So she's going to be a mixture of the two, so there can be a different personality. And so she's beginning to modify and complexify, perhaps, if that's a word, um, her understanding of identity, uh, national identity for her daughter. And the implication is that although she, Lynn, makes this distinction between, or this, this statement that I can never be Belgian, I will always be English, it's either or for her, she's got some theory about some kind of, I suppose, dual nationality, but she's not talking citizenship here, she's talking ethnicity, uh, some different complexity with respect to her theory about her daughter. But she uses the word personality as opposed to identity. Well, let's keep going. Now, what about being European ten years later? And um, she told us that as a consequence of her year in France where she couldn't really become French but could be European, as soon as she finished her degree, her studies, she had to return to her English university to do that for one year and then she finished her, her BA um, and then looked for a job in Europe. It's a wonderful place, Europe, it's, you know, it covers anything. Your definitions of Europe is an interesting topic, which again we won't go into. But she looked for a, a place in Europe, a job in Europe, and she ended up in um, working as a, an office manager for a group of uh, what we call them, lawyers, uh, most of whom in, apparently were, it was an American firm working in Brussels. Um, so, which, which we looked into for other purposes as well. But let's go to what she said about Europe being European now. Remember, ten years earlier, she'd said you could be, it's an alternative, as it were, to being French. So, she says, you don't get so centred on the idea of being European. Not particularly. Obviously, I am. Obviously, I am. <laughs> and that's why I can work easily in Brussels and travel around very freely. But, that's my word, I think being European is almost not negative, but you lose the differences. And I think what's important about Europe is that there are all these different nationalities and different languages and different cultures. If you all become one mishmash of something European, what does it mean? So again, we could carry out some further uh, thinking about what she's, what's behind that. And if, if, there is, if the research had been focused upon, uh, upon identity and so on, we might have uh, got out, got much more deeply into all of those matters. Um, but my point is that Lynn has got some very interesting uh, ideas about some very interesting theory. She says, to sum up, you have to have history, you have to have the roots, and, the mean, and, uh, and that means all the differences. You just have to you just have European as, if you just have one, European as one globular thing, I don't think so. I think it's good that Europe is becoming stronger and the economy is improving. She's got a theory of, of, of globalization here as well. And we're defending ourselves a bit better against the Americans. Uh, but as a whole entity, I think it's hard. Everyone feels European. But that will never be your nationality. And so it goes on. But I'm, what I'm interested in is that she's got a very complex theory which throws some light upon that policy and which might also so throw some light upon the implicit policy which sometimes gets made explicit about the whole question of students in Europe um, spending at least six months and preferably a year in, a, 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 in another country, in a university in another country, which is the purpose of the Erasmus programme. Uh, not everybody here is from Europe, I'm glad to say. Um, but the Erasmus programme gives money to those students who wish to spend some time in a university in a country other than their own. 
and there's an awful lot of money goes into it. Um, and when it was originally set up, it was indeed made more or less explicit that part of the hope was that it would develop this sense of European identity or belonging to Europe or feeling that you belong to European space and so on. So all of this has, could have a significance for, for the policy. But you might say, well, it's only a case study. And it is only a case study, only in inverted commas. And the textbooks tell you cases cannot be generalised. The textbooks would say Lin's theories, they're not scientific. What's the difference between Lin's theories and the things you can go away and read in, um, in articles and, uh, and, and empirical studies of ethnicity and Europeanness, if you can find them, as I said earlier, not easily. On the other hand, Lin is a member of many groups. Uh, and constantly joining new groups and giving up old groups and constantly being part of more and less permanent groups, including the, what we can call the year abroad group. That is, all those students, and there are many of them, who have the, the same experience as she, some of whom from her own university um, and maybe from other universities, and indeed maybe from other countries, when she was spending her year in France, she would meet. And so she would create with them, uh, I'm sure, some kind of talk about, or if you like to, she would say it's talk, we might call it discourse, but she would have talked about all the things that, she, that, that have been present in, in those quotations. So Lynn's theories even if it's only one person giving them, giving them to us, are, are, are I, I would say, created in that talk with other people. And just as the theories and the outcomes of empirical research uh, of the kind that I mentioned earlier, whether it's experimental or survey, are claimed to and hopefully have the power to predict what people will do. That's, after all, one of the purposes of, of, of experimental research and, attempt and, and uh, survey research and so on. Just as that kind of research helps us to predict what people will do and helps us to predict, if you like, what language learning, the effects of language learning will be, so do Lynn's theories. Since, clearly, for her daughter, it's predicting what she's doing. She's told us so. She's doing things for her daughter, like joining the National Trust. It's, predict she's, it's helping us to know what kinds of things she will do and how she will um, bring up her daughter. And her daughter being, uh, how shall I put it, increasingly, as it were, representative of the next generation uh, of, of, of young people in, in Europe. There are many Lynns living with many, and living in many countries uh, throughout Europe. So, the significance of, of Lynn is that she equally helps us to think about policy just as much as any, uh, if you like, uh, scientific, experimental work would do. And I use the word scientific when I should say natural scientific some, uh, as a model. So that's two options, doing the experiments and surveys, looking at uh, how people themselves think about and understand and therefore respond and, and uh, react and do things in their lives as a consequence of their own theories. A third option is what I call advocacy research. And this, uh, this uh, is again linked with what, somebody, some, what some one of you said yesterday. What, what if we want to, as researchers, get involved? Um, well, you can. You can become involved through your research. Of course, you can, be, you can become involved, you can put your research aside and, and, and become a, uh, an involved and committed person in, in other ways, working for a political party or whatever. But as a researcher, you can choose your topic for political reasons. Uh, you can choose your method 
for political reasons in ways which will lead to change, which will advocate or argue for, for change, hence the word advocacy. Um, just to go back to the point that David Block uh, made, and which I said, mentioned earlier, that there is empirically, there's very little evidence, if any, he couldn't find more than a couple of studies, of the effect of language teaching in classrooms, foreign language teaching in classrooms, the effect of that on the learners' identities. Uh, he couldn't find any, and what, what he did found indicated very little effect. On the other hand, I guess that the teachers in those empirical studies were not trying to change people's identities. So perhaps it's not surprising that it didn't happen. If uh, the teacher had been, or if the teacher researcher under the more classic notion of, of, um, of uh, action research tries to do that, then maybe empirically it will be possible to find the supporting evidence. So I've just got a, an example for you from some more classic uh, action research. This is J Jesse, who um, comes from Taiwan, or, and is now in Taiwan. Um, and this was her, her doctoral research. And that's her topic, uh, that's her title, rather. Um, and Jessie it, it was, she's changed her career for various personal reasons, but she was a teacher of English in Taiwan. Uh, and she was concerned about the teaching of English in Taiwan, partly from her day-to-day -day experience, but partly as a consequence of doing her, uh, her doctoral work and reading. Um, so she decided, as it were, to get involved. That wasn't quite the phrase that she, she used at the time. But this is the sort of thing, then, that she was saying in her thesis. What I've got here are some extracts from her thesis. Just to give you the background, but it was part of her rationale for doing what she was doing. Um, so, this is what she said. English is now the primary language used among speakers from around the world for international communication. In response to this fact, there are calls for a paradigm shift in English language teaching in respect of the increasing English users who speak English as an international language. With Taiwan's cultural politics background, English has long been portrayed and perceived as a prestigious foreign language which represents a pas passport to better economic gains, education and social status. Edu economic gains, again, that's the sort of thing that you find widely, including, uh, although I didn't actually give you the quote, but including in the European Union policy document that I started with. This perception of English has not only brought about a phenomenon of English fever in Taiwan, but also endorsed an economic, pragmatic view in learning English as an international language. Consequently, it has reinforced ELT practices to aim at preparing learners of English for being competitive instead of understanding of others. So, I'm just giving you a feel for what Jesse was saying in her thesis. And in a way, Certainly, one chapter, I can't remember exactly, but quite a substantial part of her thesis was to lay out, with the help of the literature, of course, Jesse's view of ELT, English language teaching in Taiwan, and what it ought to be. And then, of course, she wanted to get involved. So she did, as I said, get involved through a kind of classic action research project. So, again, this is quotation from her, based on an educational philosophy that today's English language teaching should, and the word should is crucial, this is what she, she, she thinks, should prepare learners as world citizens instead of global human capital, instead of the, and of course behind all of this is her reading about human capital theory, instead of global human capital and the whole question of languages for economic gain, instead of that, the purpose of this action research is to, project is to provide an intercultural communicative way of teaching English. 
Um, and I'm not, yes, we started at 10, didn't we? Um, and so she goes on with her project. And it's not all that important what the de details are, but she had her technical college students, and that was interesting in itself because, mm, because you would expect technical college students to be all the more interested in learning English for economic purposes and for job purposes. Um, uh, and she had her 42 uh, students and herself, the teacher researcher, um, and she had nine lessons and so on, and she had a project. And she carried out her different kinds of data collection in the way that uh, action research does. And then, at the end, and this is a quotation from the final chapter, the findings suggest that, um, with some minor technical modifications needed in the future, the proposed pedagogy can help learners not only find their confidence in learning and utilising English language in their daily life, so she's not casting aside the economic argument and the usefulness argument, but also deep learners, she puts it, cultures of self and others. Thus, it might result that learners in becoming well it might result the learners. Uh, <clears throat> I think that's my fault, not Jesse's. It might result in the learners becoming world citizens in a gradual, progressive manner. So, uh, uh, and ultimately, what she would have hoped for, uh, it didn't quite work out in practice because of personal reasons, but. Um, that she would be able to, uh, to disseminate and use what she had shown in her research in her technical college and perhaps more widely. And in that sense, she, her project, her work, was quite deliberately hoping to have some impact on the world around her and on English language teaching in particular. So that raises a quite different relationship between researcher and policy. And policy, of course, begins uh, in schools as, uh, or colleges in this case, as much as it begins in, in ministries. So she's not just someone who, as some researchers do, seeks to answer the politicians' questions, those people who are asked to provide evidence for policy. And that's a widespread phenomenon, at least in the UK. Um, but she is someone who's asking questions about policy and indeed challenging the current policy. And the rest, and, and a substantial part of her thesis was to analyze the policy that uh, she called a human capital policy in, uh, her, uh, in, in Taiwan, in her country. Um, so, what she therefore has produced is some support for an assertion about the way in which language teaching can have an impact. Some support in a case study, again, but case studies are important. Some support for the idea that there can be a cause and effect relationship, not this time between language learning and European identity or any other kind of identity, but between uh, language learning and intercultural understanding. That's what she was m most focused upon. So, what I've been trying to do in all of this is say, well, there are three, if you like, three methods, three general methods. One to do with, which is based on a, on a natural sciences way of thinking, carrying out experiments, or if, that doesn't, if that's not possible, carrying out surveys. Um, one which is much more focused upon understanding people's own theories about the world and treating those as just as important because those are equally going to help us predict what people do and therefore just as important for policy making. Um, and thirdly, an advocacy uh, notion, action research. It's not a matter of qualitative versus quantitative. Um, I know that textbooks, this is my, one of my hobby horses, 
I know that textbooks talk about the qualitative paradigm and the quantitative paradigm, um, but it's nonsense. What there is, I, I would suggest, is that you use the word qualitative and quantitative to refer to data types. Uh, and any type of data, whether it's uh, an interview or an answer to a questionnaire, can be quantified. And, and so it's not a matter of some data is of its nature qualitative or some data, data is of, of its nature. Some data are of their nature uh, qualitative or quantitative and some data are of their nature uh, quantitative or, or qualitative but the way in which you treat them. So that's just something which maybe uh, some of you when I've in the course of this week uh, will we'll get comments will probably recognize that from the sort of things that comments that I make on people's work. Um, it is important therefore just as much to look at what you like what you might want to call folk theories to explain and predict so cause and effect is not something that is uh, only the area only the how shall I put it only the, the, the that only um, the, the systematic theories can have some uh, something to say about and research in a political context is something that you can think about for your own work. What you do as a researcher is important, I think, in the course of this. Now I know that many people here, well, you're at different stages. Um, and so you might have made these decisions already. Uh, whether you are the disinterested researcher, whether you are the committed researcher, whether you're going to try to explain by observation or whether you're going to try to ex understand by getting involved, whether you're going to do work which is finding out or whether you're going to do research which is advocacy. But I just wanted to add one or in perhaps even two other things since I thought I would do this if there is time and I think there's a bit of time left, right. Uh, I don't need all that but it's one something that I just wanted to throw in at the end, um, because although advocacy research, as I've called it, deliberately tries to change things and show that things are changeable, all research which involves well, what we call them, uh, Karen yesterday had the word informants, I'm glad to, and, and I'm sure deliberately avoided the word subjects, um, maybe we can also call them participants the people who are involved, whether they are people who are being interviewed, people who are being observed, people who are in, in focus groups, people who are in individual interviews, or even people who are just filling out a questionnaire. The fact of doing so changes you, I suggest. Um, and in that sense, you learn from being part of a research project, even if it's only an online uh, questionnaire, which I believe uh, some of you are using. And that's again, I mean, I would like finally to link all, all of what I've been saying into Karen's nice diagram yesterday. That's something that we need to think about from the ethical point of view. Not that we can change it, as it were. You, can, you, you need your data. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, it's something you must be aware of that filling in, let me just give you an example, since we've got five, eight, five minutes or less now left. Um, in the UK, there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a big research project going on which addresses people over the age of 55, which you will not be surprised to know I am, uh, and which is a, 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 a medical survey. And um, it's, it, I don't know if millions of people are involved, and the idea is that they're, going to, they're surveying people about their medical condition and you, uh, you agree to have your medical records open to the, not to the public, but to the project uh, over the next, well, until you die. Um, and so I said I'll fill this thing in and go for, my, go for the various tests and so on. Um, and I became aware as I was filling out the survey about my activity and my behavior, things like how many times do you go upstairs every day? Um, what do you do when you, uh, are you the sort of person who breaks the speed limit? 
Obviously, you could see behind, well, I could and many people, you could, I'm sure, see behind the questions what they were getting at. Uh, I thought, and I also found myself, therefore, filling in the so socially acceptable. I knew it was a good thing to say, yeah, I, go, I walk up and downstairs ten times rather than five times a day. So now I've started walking, I, so therefore I ticked ten times, and I've now made sure that I do go upstairs and downstairs ten times a day. That's what I mean by the pedagog pedagogical uh, function of research. <laughs> then there's a whole other area which, we have, which I hope will come up in the course of the week, um, and which I think needs a lot more thinking about than has been the case so far, uh, and, and the, uh, not a lot more writing about than has been the case so far. Many of you will be collecting data in one language and reporting it in another. Um, so, there's a, uh, and, and I've been su supervising students for more years than I care to think about, but uh, and at the beginning of those years, it was just, well, yeah, collect your data in Arabic, but you'll have to translate it for me into English, because I don't read Arabic. Um, questionnaires or interviews or whatever it may be. But of course, things get, to use that quote, uh, lost in translation. But un until relatively recently, that's just being pushed under the surface, under the carpet. Uh, it's something that needs to be thought about an awful lot more in the sort of work that uh, I've read about in some of your essays. So the whole question of, the sort of question which comes up, um, oh, I'll translate it for you, and then I'll, 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 I'll transcribe the interviews, uh, and I'll translate them, and then we'll do the analysis to, for me as the, stu as the supervisor. Uh, with a, in a language that I don't understand. This, somebody was mentioned this already yesterday. It's a big question as to what stage translation gets done and needs to be done. So maybe that's just for, something for you to think about in the course of the week. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mike, for a very stimulating lecture with a range of interesting and elusive examples. Um, we have now um, about a quarter of an hour for discussion, so I invite comments and questions. Yes? Well, I'm glad you're using the microphone yeah. because yes. being over the age of 55, <laughs> I need to hear loud and clear what you're saying. Okay. Am I is this working? Yes. Yeah, thank okay. you. yeah, thank you very much. Um, I want to get back to that second option you mentioned, because yeah. um, as I took it, the question of what belonging means or European belonging means um, is pointing to, to practice how uh, European belonging is experienced yeah. and lived, actually. So speak up a bit or yeah, take speak it closer? Yeah, speak up a bit and hold it up a bit, yeah. Okay. Hold it a bit near your mouth and also speak up a bit. Yeah. I can't hold it any closer <laughs> than that. <laughs> or I swallow it. <laughs> yeah, okay, you better start again so that it goes onto the recording, I think. Should I start again? Yeah. Okay. Um, so as I took it, um, the second option is the, the question what European belonging means is pointing to a lived experience and to practice. And that's why I was wondering um, because you were pointing at uh, Lin's theories, and um, to yeah, and I'm wondering to what extent can theories of actors explain or predict their actual practice? Because that would mean that um, their <laughs> go on that yeah. their um, that their theories, uh, that, that to, to them is transparent, or th uh, that, they, that they can reflect what is actually orienting their practice. And as far as I know, this is not the case, because um, theories of self are uh, rationalizations of practice. And yeah, so yeah. that's and my it may question. be that, of course, that by being involved in that research, to take my last, oh, my penultimate point, being involved in research, and being asked uh, at age 21 and again at age 31 to, to think about these things. As I said, that wasn't the focus of the interview, but something that came up in the interview. Um, has an effect upon 
what she is, how she's rationalizing, how she's thinking about what she's doing. I mean, but I have to believe her that she joined the National Trust. I have to believe her that she's thinking about what, how her child, her daughter's um, personality, as she put it, is going to be different from her own. Now, why she does those things um, may only become clear to her as a consequence of being in, involved in that project, as a participant in that project. And to that extent, maybe she's not representative, but who cares? Am I answering your question? Or are we just talking to each other? <laughs> Which is also worthwhile. Yeah. Mm. Maybe, it's not a question. Maybe, maybe I have to think a little bit uh, longer about it. I, I'm not sure if this is answering my question. It's... Um, Yeah, okay, I, we, yeah, yeah. you think it will go next to I don't know how to put it. Uh, Fred? <clears throat> Thank you, Mike, for your, for your talk. Um, um, thinking about um, the term you used, uh, folk theories, now, in the examples that you gave, I was wondering, I mean, I can't see the researcher, and the researcher no. is contributing to yeah, creating yeah, yeah, yeah. this folk theory, so, I mean, what sort of questions were asked, and, you know, who were the researchers, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, did yeah. they know them, etc. Because yeah. when we talk, especially about something as, well, I would say empty, because I'm, I'm a negative person, but as, as um, European identity, I mean, it's, it's very easy to see that, you know, um, uh, depending on who is asking the questions, the people will definitely change. And I know we're not interested in the truth. I mean, knowing, as, as you just said... Oh, if I, you am. I am. <laughs> I am interested in the truth. But anyway, go on. Okay. <laughs> well, but, 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 okay. But uh, whatever that means, I mean, <laughs> it would be interesting to talk about what we mean by, by the truth. But, but so where's the, where's the researcher in, in the data yeah, that yeah, you showed yeah. here? Well, I guess that's why I made some caveats at the beginning, that, uh, and it, uh, that uh, it's only an example, and I had to seek for a material which is connected with the, with the, time, the topic of the... Um, and I haven't got, well, I haven't got to hand the whole transcripts, but they, just to... So what the researcher was asking at the time, uh, I, I can't remember. I, I would need to look at the transcripts again. But given that the, um, what was interesting for me was that she'd probably been asked about, I'm sure she was asked about how people saw her, how she felt about being English in France when, during her year abroad, in the first quotation. She is the one who brought up the question of Europeanness uh, and talked about, you can be European though. So in that respect, she wasn't stimulated one way or, or the other. Um, and she has a sense of, of, of what being European is for her. And that's, I think, interesting, at the very least. It also has an impact upon what she does for her child. And it also had an impact, I suspect, upon what she chose to do post-degree level. Again, I can remember vaguely what she was, that indeed, uh, ten years later, um, she explained that she certainly looked for a job in Europe um, as a consequence of her year abroad. The follow-up survey was to ask what's the, what are the long-term impacts, and in particular it was con concerned with whether their um, intercultural competence, as we picked it up to some extent in the first lot of interviews, had in some way had a long-term um, life, if it continued to be interculturally competent as it were, and to what extent they'd drawn upon it consciously or unconsciously. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Um, I, I want to pick up on, on the notion of truth and, um, and the kind of uh, what we do with the verbal data that we collect, because um, undoubtedly uh, what the, the informant said is, is true 
to what they believe and what they obviously want to bring across. But because it is a co-constructed, almost going back to Bart's mythology, Europeanness has become a, a myth. It's not just belonging to a place on the map being called Europe. When you say I'm European, and in her data, it seems to me becomes quite clear, uh, there is a, an element of prestige, an element of distinction, of symbolic distinction in associated with Europeanness that grows the more you talk about it, the more it, um, that she is building in cahoots, in complicity with her hearer, with her listener. And that's where if, if the interlocutor had not been European, maybe the dynamic would have been different. But what it, it occurs to me that we've got to look at those data, at those verbal data, in their symbolic, mythical meaning. When she says, you know, countering Americanness with Europeanness or world citizenship, you have the feeling there is a, almost a, um, a battle of symbolic prestige that is going on there, all verbal and, and emotional, etc., that we need to probably factor in when we read the data, the kind of wonderful data that you have presented. Yeah. So it's a semiotic work. Yeah, yeah, we we course, almost yeah. need to recapture Bach's second semiological chain uh, to see that these words are not just words out of the dictionaries or, uh, or references to places on the maps, but are in fact uh, mythical representations uh, that are symbolically much more than, than just referential. Yeah, I mean, I'm not quite sure what mythical means and these the symbolic I'll go with. But this, this says, this is not, you know, this is not a, a myth as it were, this is, it says on the top European Union. Underneath it says United Kingdom, Great Britain, Northern Ireland. Um, in that sense, and of course there's a confusion in, 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 the, uh, in, in the statements here. It says nationality and nationalité, and then underneath it says British citizen. British citizen. So there's a, an awful lot of confusion in this document between nationality and citizenship. But nonetheless, this is an indication that there is a sense of, there is a, a legal status involved here. And that's true. <laughs> but somebody else wanted to say something. Anybody can say anything. I mean, it doesn't have to be a question to me. Okay. I think you. <clears throat> yeah, I um, just want to say something adding on to what's been yeah, said. Yeah, it doesn't um, have to be a question to I, me, by the way. Yeah, it seems to me that here we're talking, I mean, we've got to look at it also in the context of a, an increasing convergence of Europe and the EU, because this is what's happening, really what's been happening for the last 50 years. So, and these are two overlapping concepts, it seems to me, which are increasingly convergent. So that's one thing that we've got to bear in mind. Um, the other thing I wanted to, um, to say is that that example with Lynn's um, answers um, really captures very well what um, a lot of tension uh, going on in about Europeanness and European identity, and especially with regards to multilingual policies, because um, yes, the EU um, is coordinating uh, multilingual policies, but ultimately uh, there's still the responsibility of member states to implement. So they are effectively constrained by. Um, for instance, uh, foreign languages in, in school curriculum are still constrained by what member states decide to, uh, to do about them. And I think this is also a, another important point and to me reinforces the idea of um, the importance of um, doing something about it to, to, to really promote a, a, a better kind of multilingualism in, in Europe, uh, because as we know at the moment, for instance, in the UK, 
foreign languages are effectively um, restricted to uh, French and Spanish and possibly German uh, from, I mean, secondary schools and, and, and that's it. And I'm sure there's, there's a lot of scope for uh, improving things on that side. It's interesting, isn't it, that we're getting, I was about to say bogged down in, but I better not say that, but we're getting involved in this question of Europeanness. My, what I hoped <laughs> to be saying is something about making sure your research questions are clear and making sure you've decided on the, on the, the methods that you're using are appropriate and be clear about, because from some of the things I've read in preparation for this week, there's still a need for that. Uh, and it, my talk was as much about methodology as about content, but clearly you're interested in content. So that's fine. I think some might want to say something. Okay. Yeah. okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Your question. No, I, think, I think Mike is next. Okay, I mean, I, mean, I think the, the point that Claire made about the sort of, the, as it were, the mythologizing of Europe is, I think, a, a good one. But in a sense, in her case study yesterday, we saw the mythologizing of France, that there's a, we, there's a constant sort of myth mythologizing tendency going on. Mm. If we look at your case study, I think we see a, almost a, a progressive sort of complexification, is the word you used, o over the time of what the speaker was orienting towards. There was French, French, Belgian, French, and that puts sort of Flemish in the picture as well. It was British, it was English, and, and European. So there's, and, and again, with the generational thing, orienting towards the choices that she might or might not want her daughter to be making. I sometimes wonder whether we jump too quickly to questions of identity or even subjectivity, that we've got evidence, if you like, of orientation towards various kind of social formations and language varieties, and we jump into calling this identity. And I just I still wonder what the evidence is, really, for, for these things. And, what, what do we, how do we know that these are identity choices what, mm. or, or questions of subjectivity, if you like? I mean, we can assume they are, but, but what's the evidence? Mm. Yeah, uh, there, is, there is one um, cat. Sorry? Yeah. Oh, yes. Thank you. Um, thank you for. Oh the no! Well, the, the, uh, it was first. <laughs> There's competition here. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. I feel a bit cheeky there, sitting on the microphone. Um, I'm interested. There was a comment earlier about truth, and there was a comment about um, observational behaviour. Is that what you were talking about? Like how you can know what someone actually thinks versus what they actually do in practice. Was that the comment you were making? Yeah, it's something I'm quite interested in in my own work. Um, the explanation that the lady gives about why she feels French in a particular moment. And obviously, as, as researchers, we kind of have to prioritize what she actually says. And in that moment, that's the data we have to deal with. But it's just something I'm interested in myself. When I talk about things, I make flippant comments that one day that is what I believe, and the next day I believe something else, something else has happened. And, I make sense of things through talking, but it's not necessarily what I believe in a given moment. And how we can kind of capture that kind of data and that kind of context in our research methods is something that really, really interests me. I don't know if it's something anyone else has, has had to deal with. Somebody else? I'm not, I don't see any need for me we, at the moment to say anything. We, we have just a couple of minutes and then we... I think Michael, you want to do you? You wanted to say something? Yeah, you... Oh, sorry, I don't... I'm very sorry I can't add anything to your question. Um, but I just wanted to ask... Um, I mean, we can be clear about the research questions. Um, we do a lot of work on definition. We heard about that yesterday, that we have to define every single term that we're using, what we're dealing with, but... Um, when it comes to the participants, um, I'm not sure if we can ask every single participant, what do you um, think about citizenship, nationality, ethnicity, what's your definition? We would have to do that. We would have to ask every single person about their definition 
of the term and that's what came up in my study even just asking about so-called facts, social demography, whatever. Um, there were so many different answers to uh, seemingly simple things and, and terms and it's, in my opinion, it's um, become becoming increasingly more difficult to even know what, what people say when they're talking about their mother tongue, their um, native language, their um, nationality or whatever. I got so many different responses, especially um, working with adolescents. And um, I find it really difficult. I mean, I can be clear about what I want to know, but how do I know that they know what I want to know? And how do I know that, <laughs> that they're actually telling me what they think about it? And that's, for me, that's uh, becoming really, really confusing to know um, what am I actually asking for? What am I finding out? Is that the answer to the question that I have elaborated on? Um, in, in my thesis, is that actually the answer to that? Or are, are we talking about totally different things? Um, I don't know, can you offer any help <laughs> in that matter? I mean, how do we go about this? We have our clear research questions, we have our terms, but then how do we actually um, deal with the participants and their definitions and their terms? Well, do you want to <laughs> well, yeah, yeah, we, 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 we only I've, have half I've got minute. something to say at yeah. the end, I think. But uh, if you want to say, no, we we, have, we, we to, to answer your question more, uh, you know, to answer your question would take have, some time we because we're talking about technical matters at the moment. <laughs> that's what I said at the beginning. I'm not interested in technical matters. I'm interested in what it is you're doing, why you're doing this research, and. Um, um, I obviously planned my, my uh, talk before yesterday, but I was struck by... Who, does somebody remember saying something like this yesterday? Who was it? Uh, okay, it was Kat who said... What was it? Something like... And, and, and that what lies behind what I was saying about different kinds of research, and in particular, the re, the, impact, the the ref, the what's the word I'm looking for? The relevance to policy and politics. Uh, I suppose my essential message is: research is political, or it can be. Well, it is, even if you say it isn't, as it were. If you choose not to, then that's a choice. That's a fairly common. Uh, common sense thing to say, and you might say, well, why did they spend an hour saying that? Um, but having read your essays, some, well, not all of them, obviously, but I've read about a dozen of them now, um, I, I think it's relevant. I think it's important to say these things. Um, and, and increasingly, the notion of reflexivity in thesis writing is important. Again, as, as, as Karen said yesterday, and you didn't use the word reflexivity, but the whole question of who you are and so on came up yesterday. Um, and increasingly people, and I, I've always encouraged increasingly over the last few years, uh, thesis writers to make this part of their thesis writing. Well, I think, I think the, this oh. is, uh, is it, we, we have to, to, okay. to stop. This is a good final note. So I thank you once more.